Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. In my mind's eye, every joint I plan snugs together with the precision of a Swiss watch. In reality, a surprisingly large number of those joints fail to live up to my dreams. So, the question that keeps recurring is, what is an acceptable margin of error? How much can I get away with? Just how forgiving is PVA glue? I began this investigation from a seemingly unrelated angle by asking just one simple question. How long does it take PVA glue to cure? If you have no idea what PVA glue is or why we care, check the other videos in the series. The links are below. The real cure rate? Well, that seemed like it would be easy to discover. Just glue up some blocks of wood, as we've done so many times in the recent past, and break one every few hours. In two days, I had the data. Now, I know that you want a very simple answer to this question, right? No math, no tables of forces, just one picture that tells the story. Okay, here it is. 30 minutes after you assemble a joint, it has about 40% of its final strength. In an hour, it has about 75%. But, you know, if you're gluing up an anchor for bungee jumping off a wooden bridge, maybe you want to wait a few more hours. But consider this. Those were perfectly cut, perfectly straight, perfectly flat joints made from thoroughly dry poplar and clamped together with no joint movement, no repositioning, no clumsy missteps. Are there any other factors that might slow down this incredibly fast cure rate? Well, I checked an almost infallible source, the internet. I didn't actually find any data, but I did find hundreds of opinions. People guessed that high humidity and wet wood would probably slow the cure rate. Waxy and oily woods might behave differently. Maybe old glue doesn't set as rapidly. However, very few of the sources I checked even mentioned the most important factor by far, glue thickness. We all know that thick paint dries much more slowly than thin coats, so it makes sense that thick glue will take longer to cure. So the first step is to determine how thick the glue lines were in the test above. Here's a highly magnified view of a simple butt joint in maple. It was clamped tightly for an hour and allowed to cure for two days. I planed it to remove surface irregularities. You can see that the joint thickness varies a little, but the two red lines are about 0.057 millimeters apart, according to my microscope. That's a little over two thousandths of an inch. Ordinary printer paper is about four thousandths, so this is tissue paper thin. Once we realize how thin a perfectly made butt joint is, then it becomes apparent why the glue sets so rapidly. The dry wood just sucks the water out of the glue with incredible efficiency, simply because it is spread so thin, just as this envelope seals in just a few seconds, and for exactly the same reason. But what happens if the joint is not tissue paper thin? I'm willing to admit that sometimes my joints end up a little loose. Does that make any difference? I started out by cutting some joints with a substantial gap and repeated the experiment above. This is a jig that let me mill out a thin layer from one side, but leave two little shoulders to act as spacers. I prepared six sets of blocks. I glued them all up at the same time. The back of the joint was taped to prevent glue from oozing out. I used enough glue to overfill all the joints and then wiped away the excess after clamping. I then broke each of the sets of blocks at various intervals to create a curve that shows the cure rate. Here's what the curing time looks like with a 1.2 millimeter gap or 47 thousandths of an inch. You can see it's dramatically different. It takes hours to develop even a small fraction of the strength of a thin joint. So you can now see that claiming that PVA glue sets up in an hour is a huge oversimplification. Joints with a smaller gap will fall on one of the dozens of curves in between these two extremes. The thinner the gap, the stronger the joint, and the faster it will cure. But there's an even more important observation. You can see that the joint never achieves more than about 20% of the strength of a thin joint, 
even if you wait for weeks for it to cure fully. Exactly how much strength do you lose by leaving a small gap in your joinery? Well, I cut a set of test blocks from Poplar with a whole range of gaps. I let them cure for 21 days, plenty of time, and then broke them in my press. The results look like this. Note that a gap of about half a millimeter causes the loss of almost half the potential strength of the glue joint. In case you can't quickly visualize half a millimeter, that's the thickness of the most common lead for mechanical pencils. So, if you cut on the wrong side of a pencil line, you've cut your strength almost in half. For woodworkers in America who don't use metric very often, here's the same curve converted to imperial measurements. A gap of two hundredths of an inch cuts your glue strength in half. That might be plenty of strength for a piece under very little stress, but it might be a joint failure for others. Experienced woodworkers have known for generations that it's important to make tight joints. The ancient Egyptians knew this 3,500 years ago. However, I never ran across any data that showed exactly what happened if your joint was just a little sloppy. Until now. And I was shocked to see how very little tolerance the glue has for joints that are just a little bit loose. I realize that many of you have such high standards that if a mortise is even a tiny bit wide, you'll throw the piece out and start over. However, there are also quite a few people who, like me, will say, nah, it's close enough. I'll just add lots of glue. You know who you are. And now we get to the critical observation in our investigation, which so many woodworkers have overlooked, even though it's not a secret and is out in plain sight for all to see. PVA glue is about half water. Tight bond, too, in fact, is 52% water. All that water will either evaporate or be absorbed into the wood. When that happens, the glue will lose half its volume. This is so important that I need to say it again. The glue loses half its volume. There is nothing you can do to stop this. It's important to grasp that there are two entirely different kinds of joints. Joints like simple butt joints are a good example of the first group. As the glue loses volume, this type of joint responds by reducing its volume too. The surfaces move closer together to take up some of the space left when the water evaporates. As the glue shrinks, it pulls the two parts of the joint closer together. You've probably experienced this. When you applied the clamps, you twisted them tightly. When you took the clamps off, were you mildly surprised at how easy they were to unclamp? Did I really leave them that loose? No. The shrinking glue plus the clamp pressure pulled the joint tighter. But there is a second type of joint that cannot alter its geometry to reduce its volume. A good example is a mortise and tenon joint. The joint volume is whatever space inside the mortise is not occupied by the tenon. You can fill 100% of that space with glue, but when it cures, the glue will only fill half that volume. The result is that voids and bubbles cover large areas. They reduce the strength of the glue joint. You cannot fix this by using extra glue. The joint will only contain a certain fixed amount of glue. When it dries, it will be half the volume of the joint space. The other half of the joint space will be empty. Let's actually look inside this type of joint. To see the dried glue better, I added a tiny amount of green watercolor pigment. It's an inert mineral, chromium oxide. Think of it as green rust. It has no effect on the glue other than making it easier to see. Here's a test joint that I made in blocks that have three different gaps cut into them. They were filled to maximum capacity, and the squeeze-out puddle was left on top for 30 minutes to partially replace some of the volume lost to evaporation. After the glue cured, the joint was broken on my press. Unfortunately, type 2 joints usually don't snap open suddenly. They open in small steps. Look at this weird, lacy pattern in the glue. This happens every time. 
The shiny, dark green areas are the places where a large void occurred. The glue stuck to both sides of the joint, but did not span across the gap to hold the two pieces together. The lacy, lighter green lines were the only glue areas that were actually binding the joint, and they were riddled with bubbles. The voids and bubbles developed as the water migrated out of the glue. The thinner gaps had smaller voids, but otherwise looked similar to the big gaps. Notice how different the glue in the gap areas looks compared to the strips of wood that made direct contact with each other. There are no visible bubbles or voids there. Interestingly, the glue has broken away in a striped pattern. This is a phenomenon that's unique to pine and other soft woods. It's related to the fact that the softer spring growth rings which look remarkably like strips of carpeting under my microscope, are cut in a much more ragged fashion than the harder fall growth rings. They look torn. Compare the pine on the left with the maple sample on the right. Both were cut with the same saw blade, on the same jig, at the same feed rate. It's bizarre how different they are. This ragged spring growth surface attracts and holds the glue more avidly than the harder, denser fall growth line, even though the glue was initially spread evenly over the whole surface. Incidentally, roughing up the maple end grain does not produce this carpet-like texture. Brisk sanding with 60 grit sandpaper leaves deep scratches, but nothing even vaguely like the pine. But I digress. This investigation is not about the difference between soft and hard wood. It is not about the curious and unique way that pine attaches to glue. It is about grasping the fact that gaps devastate the holding power of PVA glue. I've heard all my life that PVA glue does not fill gaps, but until I saw these pictures, I just did not understand that even tiny gaps change the gluing process profoundly. Are there other joints that cannot move closer together to accommodate glue shrinkage? Oh yeah. Finger joints, box joints, dovetails, dowels, leg stretchers. Mitered frames or boxes have joints that individually can change their spacing, but once part of a four-joint system, cannot move closer together. There are also simple butt joints that can have built-in gaps. For example, pieces that have warped or cupped, making the glue surface curved. You might be able to eliminate the curve with powerful clamps, but maybe not. What about cut lines that are not straight? And finally, what about joints in which foreign material prevents the two surfaces from touching uniformly? This could be wood chips or splinters, or debris, or maybe even pieces of hardened glue from the nozzle of the glue bottle. What should you take away from all this? First, PVA glue sets up incredibly rapidly if the joint surfaces are straight, flat, and touching, and the wood is dry. However, if all those conditions are not present, the answer is different. If there are any spaces or gaps in the joint line, then the curing will be delayed and the strength will be compromised. Gaps larger than half a millimeter, the thickness of a pencil line, will cause the joint to lose more than half its potential strength. Gaps that are much larger than this will result in very weak joints. But, there is a simple fix for many joints that suffer from gaps. Don't try to add more glue. Instead, simply cut a thin shim or a veneer of the same wood to fill the gap. Remember the lesson from the first video in this series. PVA glue is stronger than the lignin that holds the wood fibers in place. As long as the shim is glued on both sides, it will be just as strong as if it were part of the tenant in the first place. A critical issue is to fill all the gaps in type 2 joints with wood and not glue. How forgiving is PVA glue? If you demand high strength, then it's not very forgiving at all. I hope those of you who occasionally cut less than perfect joints find this information helpful. By the way, thanks for all your intelligent comments and suggestions in this series of videos. Your support in this crazy shop science project is heartening. As always, Thanks for watching.